You're listening to the Handcrafted Therapy Podcast with massage therapist and business owner, Julie Alexander. That's me. I'm your host. I've been a massage therapist for 17 years, and I have a business marketing degree. On this podcast, we'll be interviewing industry professionals that can talk to us about how to run your business better, how to be a better massage therapist overall, and how to take care of yourself and give yourself a little love, a little self-care, a little grace in your life. I am so glad that you're here. Thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Well, Thanks for joining us, James. I'm so thankful to have you here. You've had a long, successful career in the massage therapy industry. Um, for a long time, I've been, I've been a massage therapist for 15 years now. And, you know, I, you are one of my very first instructors that I've learned under. And I'm so thankful for you and the knowledge that you passed along to me over the years. And I practiced probably every massage doing something that I've, I've been taught from you. So thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge and and passing that along. I was also involved in the AMTA, which is the American Massage Therapy Association. And you've been so kind to be involved with that organization for many years as well. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your own words? Yeah, Julie, just a little brief background. I was a paramedic firefighter for 20 years before massage. And, and then when I got into massage, I had good mentors like Benny Bond, who's here in Fort Worth, Texas, and some of the great mentors. And my goal since I was a therapist, my first goal was to go to the Olympics in Atlanta. So Benny, Benny helped that, me achieve that goal. In fact, that's why I retired as a paramedic. My captain wouldn't let me off. So I, I said, you know what? I'm going to the Olympics. I'm going to retire. I've got 20 years in and I went into massage full time. Best choice I ever made, actually. And now I'm traveling 45 weekends to 15 different countries. And my audience is just not massage. I'm teaching two or three chiropractic conferences a year. I'm teaching physiotherapy, physical therapy, osteopaths in Europe. And my dream when I got in the profession was that everybody would integrate the chiropractor, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, the osteopath, and we'd all play nice together and work good together and share patient information, patient outcome. And it's happening right now. So I'm pretty excited. That's incredible. I love that story. I'm so I'm so glad to hear that, you know, you're you're back up and running. You mentioned when we first got on the phone that, you know, the pandemic has slowed us down quite a bit and we had very little in class um, in in person classes during the pandemic, but now we're pretty much back up and running full speed, right? Which What's great, Julie, is I just had a class in Iowa, AMTA, Iowa Conference, and there was 130 just in my classroom in a big ballroom, big stage, all set up. And what I'm finding is people are hungry for that tribe. They're hungry for that, those hugs, that laughter, that compassion, that interaction. You know, I was online on Zooms for, I did all my courses are online, 13 different courses approved by NCTMB, and we did hundreds of Zooms. But it's not the same when you can't hug your friend or your colleague or share stories or catch up with people that you've known for years. So I really think the online has a purpose, but my passion is to interact and motivate therapists to be the best therapist they can be and, you know, get through those difficult times and things like that. So I, I really, I, I was, you know, I'm 67 years old and, and the thought of retirement completely disappeared after COVID. I missed being on the road, traveling all over the world. And mostly I miss motivating therapists to be the best therapist they can be and to get through difficult times that we all have. You know, 220 was a tough year for everybody. Yeah, it really was. It really was. So you've had some personal and professional struggles throughout your life and your career. Do you want to share this, any of this with us? Sure. I always tell people going through storms that when you get through the storm, you're going to have a lesson and a purpose and a reason. And when you're in the middle of a storm, it's not fun. So, so you know, I've had early in my career, I thought Brent and I could run the business and that wasn't smart. We hired Allison trail to maybe Allison was been with us for 19 years now. And what we realized is that massage therapists aren't world-class marketers and they're not. So we needed business people. So when we brought in a business person, when I have 20 conferences a year and 45 seminars a year and we're in 15 countries, everything from the marketing, the emails, the website, the website design, getting stuff out immediately within 24 hours, it was impossible for us. So, so 
I think one of the mistakes I made early in my career is hiring a massage therapist to do a job that I needed marketing experts to do. And so you, you're trying to be economical, but you know, cutting corners on websites. And I think cutting corners was an issue. One of the other things I went through, and I want to give credit to my wife, Fran, is when I first got in the profession, I kind of had low self-esteem. I grew up in a little farm in North Dakota. Um, and I think when you have low self-esteem and lack of confidence, you come across with a thing called ego, which is the greatest regret of my life. I learned through my wife, whose father, Manny's Major League Baseball, that go serve the community. We're not here to talk about ourselves. We're, talk we're here to help other people. And I think if I could give people advice, new therapists that think they know it all and know that you know about that much when you get them in Cisco, be humble, be kind, come from a place of love and compassion. And then 220 was really a pivot in my life. It was, uh, you know, our business was shut down. We had no income coming in. And then I was hit by a, a drunk driver on my car. A lot of people don't know about this because this was back in 220. You know, and I had most of my teeth were knocked on. I had dental implants. Some of them were knocked I had to do implants. I had, I found out in Canada, I had a, a concussion. And I think what happened when then I was walking on crutches, I think that storm, I mean, humility, compassion, empathy. So now I'm basically saying that the difficult times in your life, when you just think, can I take on one more thing, are the ones that could launch us to another career. And, and, and for me, it helped me find out who are my real friends were. It helped me find out how important my wife was. It helped me find out, you know, my spiritual life went to another level. So for me, it was, a, it was I think, every obstacle I've ever had, every journey transition I've had. You look back and go, I'm glad I went through that, but I don't want to do it again. I learned a lesson. I'm a better person. Our company has grown. I mean, we had to rebuild our whole company because there were no seminars coming in in 220. We went from, I had 16 conferences scheduled. Each one of those had almost 100 people in March of 220. All of that went away. Our best year become our worst financially. But then I, I thought, what did I miss the most? And what I missed, Julie, was, you know, when I come to the AMTA and I, we laugh and we joke and we have these little meetings. I miss the travel. I miss the people. But I had realized how important my true friends are. I have about 110 teaching assistants in 15 countries. I miss going to dinners and spending time. And in doing that, I miss the marketing conditions because you go, well, what works, what works, what doesn't. But when you do that for 33 years, you learn what not to do and what to do. So life's journey is about experiences, storms, and then what do you learn from it and how can you grow from those, those, those events, I guess. Wow, that's incredible that, you know, you had such an impactful accident that really completely changed your, your life. And I'm glad you made it out. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful for, for that. that but but <clears throat> man, what a struggle that could be when your life is literally on the line and you, you have to refocus you know, and actually think about what is important in your world and what is important in life. Um, and I think therapists need to know that there's going to be bumps, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be deaths, there's going to be tragedies. And I think through faith, you know, I, I think you just go, I'm in this storm, but look beyond it. And I think whether that be your business, your marketing, your personal life, your relationships, I think there's a lesson to be learned in every challenge and every, every, everything we do. So I feel pretty blessed right now. I think I'm at Spiritually, I'm probably the best place I've ever been. Our business is re back where it was pre 2020. I'm very thankful of that. So, so I want to share those stories and experiences with people so they can know that there's going to be tough times in business, there's going to be tough times in relationships, there's going to be tough times with health. And um, don't sweat the small stuff, really. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a very good lesson because we all go through it every day. And we're all, I mean, every day is, there's challenges that present themselves. Some of them are small and some of them are big. Yeah. I'm getting ready to open up a massage supply store and training center in Plano. I don't know if you knew that or not, but, but it'll, it'll be, be off of, of Central, Central Expressway, Expressway in Plano and Parker. And there, you know, we're three months, you know, past when I thought we were going to be opened, but, you know, perseverance. Yeah. You know, stick to itness, whatever you want to call it. it. It is something to be said for that. And we've got such an amazing industry of, of people that are 
em- embracing new generations and embracing people that have been in the business for a long time. And we're all this like one big family. And I can see where when you were out in 2020, 2021, how, I mean, I felt that too. You know, where are my people? <laughs> I need uh, to give my hug. I know, um, I know. And it's so nice to start coming back to real life. You know, I oftentimes comment on how, you know, the before times, this is what we did in the before times. And, and it kind of feels like a, a, a big line between pre COVID and post COVID. Yep. But, you know, we've learned a lot from this. I mean, as a society, as an industry, you know, we, I talk about it a lot in my podcast on how we shifted in our businesses to accommodate new, uh, you know, new cleaning regimens and new protocols that might make our clients feel safer. But, you know, one thing we talk about a lot in my podcast is mar- marketing and business side of things. And massage therapists, like, as you mentioned, are not business, are not usually business professionals or not usually marketing experts. I've had the great fortune to graduate from college with a business marketing degree. And I'm very thankful to be able to use that in my own practice and share that with people on this podcast. For those people that may may not be in a position to be able to afford an Allison, a person who does your marketing for you, what would you recommend for those kinds of people? I would say, you know, talk, ask questions to people and, and say, what's working? You know, when I, we used to do a cruise seminar for 20 years and, and you didn't know this story either, but in 1990, uh, 1993, it was Deb broke. I went from, when I retired as a paramedic, I was barely making money as a male therapist in massage therapy. And so I thought I met a guy named Tony Robbins, the motivational speaker, the guy, he was with Planimer. And he kind of made, he said, whatever you thought, keep thinking will become reality. And then you just drill that in and drill that in and drill that in. And I think some, some things with marketing is that number one, surround yourself with successful people, ask questions from, and it doesn't cost you. You can call a friend and someone can call you or they can go, you know, I'm thinking of a business plan. What can I do? I think you really need to get advice, have a good website, have a nice business card, have a nice elevator speech, Treat people with kindness. If you help enough people, they're going to come back and help you. I mean, I mean, the, a lot of what we do, we barter. I mean, there's things that we barter because we've got friends that do photography and we've got friends that do other things and friends that do websites. And, you know, so we find the best price by asking people, what did you use? What's working? What's not working? You know, social media is a good, is a good platform because we, you know, I, I'll post something and there are 5,000 people see it on my site and then very adult and might repost it. And the other thing I think is align with your colleagues and don't talk bad about other professionals. I think, I think one thing that bothers me sometimes is when I go, well, what does the PT know? Well, I've trained with PhDs in physical therapy and many of them are in my classes and, and then they're teaching me a corrective exercise, functional exercise. So I think be humble, be kind to all of your colleagues, you know, ask people that are successful. Can I ask you for some advice? I mean, I mean, a lot of people will go, can I ask you what, what to do? I had one guy goes, I want to go to the Olympic Games, and this was way back in the '90s. And I said, "Well, take a class with Benny Blanc. He he was my mentor. Take you know, once you know people and make connections among the industry, you know, I volunteered. I personally volunteered for sports massage events almost every weekend my first year out of school. So I got to be great with sports massage, volunteerism with the AMTA. I was on the AMTA National Sports Massage Council from '93 to '97. Well, that opened so many doors. Now, as a result of volunteerism. I have taught almost at every state conference in the United States for AMTA state level conferences. But that, that volunteerism, that being amongst your colleagues who are in there doing the groundwork to improve the quality of the profession, I can't say enough about volunteerism. You know, I, I work on, I buy my seminars around the country and there's a, a warrior in recovery, someone that served our country. I never charge them. That's volunteerism. That's giving back, but it all comes back to you then doors mm-hmm. open. So I think get involved with the industry, get involved with your associations, ask questions. You don't have to spend a lot of marketing money, but eventually if you do have someone that knows how to do everything that Allison knows how to do, it's, it's such a blessing, but I couldn't afford that 
the first year was just for him and we were trying and we would, we weren't doing well because we weren't marketing experts. So we didn't know enough about website design. We didn't know what you would learn in your degree in marketing. We didn't, we, we were great therapists, but great therapists don't go do well if they don't know how to get themselves up public. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you mentioned trading. Because trading is an interesting subject in our industry. Some people are adamantly against trades and some people love them. I'm personally of the, of the belief that I think trading is fabulous. I really enjoy trading with other therapists. I enjoy trading with my chiropractor and my PT, my marketing experts, my hairdresser. I trade with a lot of people and and I've, I've learned a lot by doing trades, not just, you know, the act of bartering my service for theirs, but I've also learned that not all things are created equal. And sometimes, sometimes what you offer might be considered more about valuable what, than what you're getting traded for, but you're learning something no matter what, either way. Mm -hmm. You're learning maybe a technique that you don't like or that you don't want to use. You're learning a technique that you might like and think, let me steal that and, and use that on my table with my client tomorrow. And, you know, in just having a conversation with people that are experts in their fields, like you said, surrounding yourself with these experts, you don't necessarily have to pay them in money. You know, you could trade with them. I had a professor of marketing from SMU that was one of my clients. And I picked his brain because he was, he was a grad student, a marketing grad student professor. Yeah. And I would trade with him, you know. He, he, pay, he started off paying me and then I ended up saying, you know, I, all I do is spend my whole, your whole massage talking about my marketing. I'm not going to charge you for this. Well, and it's, so, you know, it's yeah. kind of a balance that you have to kind of take on yourself. Now, I realize that a lot of people out there in the massage business are, are just struggling to make rent and struggling to make their, their own payments. And that might not be something that you can afford to do, mm -hmm. but I would recommend that if you can find somebody that can help you with a massage, at least maybe do a little bit of a trade there. Yeah, I agree. And you know, I'm I'm not I'm still not a great business person. I'm a great teacher because I, I know how to combine visual, kinesthetic, auditory learning. You know, one of the one of my inspirations was actually my daughter Alex with her autism and dyslexia teaching me that she can't read a book take a test, listen to a lecture, take a test. Neither could I. I barely passed high school because I couldn't read a book, do a lecture, and take a test. I was a worst test taker ever, and I really struggled to get through high school. But then I thought, you know what? I'm going to teach the way the brain, brain process information. Some people learn visual, some kinesthetic. So we have multimedia, and you're seeing what's happening with technique, and people are learning. But I think the key in this industry, I, had a, I have about 100 teaching assistants. And one day, one of the teaching assistants went up to the student and said, you're doing it wrong. And they completely shut down. It reminded me of what my old teachers used to do. And I go, you never say that. You go, you know, can I modify something? Can I? I and people never learn from constructive negative feedback. They shut down. They just cower. So I think if you want to really be successful as a teacher, if you want to be successful as a therapist, the words you use and the words that come out of your mouth are important. healing. They're important. The connections. They're important. those those humble, kind words. Whether you're a teacher or your business person, they go a long way. People want to hang out with people that are good people. So I th think that's a big marketing thing for these therapists, especially new and upcoming therapists. I remember when I first started working with the New York Yankees in 1996, and I walked in the room and Gino, the head trainer for 25 years, goes, "We don't like massage therapists." And I'm like, "What?" Oh, he said. He said some massage therapists come in and they're they're overly cocky and they think they know it all. And they talk bad about the trainers. I go, I'm just here to learn. I said, I will follow you around like a puppy dog. I'll I'll get you coffee. I'll do. I just want to learn. You know, you're the head trainer for major league baseball for 25 years. I just want to be your servant. I want to help you. I want to learn from you. I want you to be my mentor. And I think when you do that, you know, my biggest regret in the early part of my career was my ego. And, and I think it took like challenges and, and 
who came my Abe the best was probably my wife because her father was the most humble guy I've ever met in my life. You know, he, even though he managed like Major League Baseball, he went out to communities and hospitals and, and took care of kids and he served the community. And he always said, he always said to his players, put God and family first. And I think when you put other people first and your family first, the careers, the jobs and all those things will manifest. But you, so you have to have a balance between family, personal, and you have to do self-care. For me, if I don't go out in my nature center every day and heal when I'm on the road every weekend, if I don't go out there with my dog and find some inner peace, then what am I bringing to the workshop? What am I bringing to that treatment? So I think if you want to be successful, I booked a massage a while back and I walk in the therapist goes, I'm really tired. This is my fourth massage. I've had a bad day. And I go, I'll rebook. You know, I, I don't want that seventh not great experience. So I think you have, and, and you're going to be like that unless you do self-care. So therapists need to take care of themselves. They need to eat better, work out, walk around, get in nature. I do that every day. And people don't know that because when you're on and you're in hotels and airplanes and everything every weekend, it's not the most glorious. The teaching is awesome, but the travel and the hotels and that brings you. So when I come home, my pastor said one time, when you come home, do you bring your best self back to your, your daughter and your wife? When you come home, or do you bring that exhausted person who's gone 12 hours a day teaching? And I go, you know what? That's a really good point. What do you bring back? How do you create that balance? How do you create a piece of... And success isn't just about the marketing. It's, it's about what you do for yourself. It's about self-esteem. It's about self-talk. It's about believing yourself. You know, I said to my daughter one day, one day, what's your vision? She goes, I would like to go to massage. And her career counselor said she wasn't smart enough because of her autism. Well, that didn't go over well with my wife. So she studied with her kinesthetically and she passed the Emblex the first time. But she doesn't want to work with adults. She wants to work with maybe dogs and babies. And so when you find what's in here, you're going to be great at it. But when you just, somebody else tells you the route to take or the path to take, if you don't love what you do, it's going to be a job. If you love what you do, it's going to be your passion. That's important information. You want to be a success. Well, and I, I love the message that you're presenting with, with come in, come into your job with humility. And because one thing that I like to do with, especially a new client, but I say this with my existing clients as well. I'm, I know, I know a lot of things and I'm very good at my job. I know massage very well, but I don't know you and I don't know your body like you do. And, I want to be your therapist, so I need you to teach me. And it's a very humbling place to come and say that to somebody. Um, but on the flip side of that, you want to be confident in your abilities and skills because you're much more likely to walk in and feel comfortable with somebody who goes, I know I can help you versus somebody who comes in and says, I think I may be able to do something to help you. You know, there's two different sides to that coin. So, yes, do your study, know your job, know your contraindications, know your muscles, do your learning, continuous education every however often you do it. But stay humble in the fact that the body is so complicated. There's something to learn every day. And even if you feel like you know it all, you don't know the person walking in the door. You don't know their body and their complications. You might know your own. <laughs> also, Julie, we don't know their story. We don't know their emotional life. We don't know their social life. We don't know what trauma is there. And we don't need to know. We just need to know that that's a part of their healing and be good listeners. You know, I think it's just as important to listen and to respond if they ask the question. We're not their counselors, but we have to be good listeners because there's a, an emotional part of healing that if you don't address that, you know, emotions are stored in the tissues. And if we don't allow the emotional healing to happen, you know, especially when I work with warriors that have been in Iraq and special ops, maybe seals that have been injured, there, there's a lot going on here that's manifesting pain. You know, sympathetic stress is something we need to just try to the environment of the room, the calmness of the music, good listeners. There's so many things that they leave. They go, I don't know, I just felt pampered today. You know, I don't want a therapist in the treatment room talking about him or his bad day or whatever. I want a therapist in the room to be a good look. I want a one hour of just, it's all about me. And yeah. I think when therapists offer that, they'll go, wow, that was a great therapist. I feel so better. You know, I got some, some stuff off my chest. I just, 
was able to talk and I was able to relax and I was able to feel better and their pressure was awesome. And, you know, they just were, they were good people. I, I'm going to go back to that person. People talk. I, more of my clients are were word of mouth than anything else. Yeah. They talk. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, we've talked se in several episodes about referrals and asking for referrals and talking to your clients about building your business. The ones mm -hmm. that, the ones that like you and continue to come back to see you, they want to help build your business. They want to tell their clients and friends about yeah. you, ask for the referral, you know, yeah, just, I'm trying to build my business. If you have any friends or family that need my services, you mm -hmm. know what I do. Please give them my card. Hand them a stack of business cards. Hand them whatever you have to give that, that you know, they can share. I used to, when I was building my business, on the back of my business cards, it would say your first massage is 50% off. And that's and, great. Because then they give them experience of you and your touch. Yeah, yeah that was that was a hook. And it was kind of a test for me too. Is this client a good match for my skills? And sometimes that wasn't the case and that's okay. I'll never forget the first time I fired a client. It was, I was so upset about having to do this. I didn't, I didn't, I felt awesome. <laughs> But it's boundaries, Julie. It's just that we have to respect our boundaries or we get drained emotionally and energetically and physically. And if we have those energy vampires, you might think, or whatever. And and I'm good about helping people get out of their their storm and their story. But then there's a point where you start to lose all of your energy and you get drained more in one hour than you would in seven hours. So sometimes it's just a time to talk about boundaries and go, you know what? Maybe we're just not a good fit. It's okay because because I those other seven people or however many, many more you can do that it, are going to be affected by the energy of each session as you go through it. And that's called self-care and that's called boundaries. I think that's wow. a... It absolutely is. And one thing you mentioned earlier that I'd like to reiterate as well is living in the present moment. You know, be there for your client at that time. Yeah. You know, right now we both might have things that we're thinking about doing. Okay, I've got to travel on Friday, so I got to pack and I got to do this, this, this. I've got, you know, all these things going in your mind to the future, things that might have happened yesterday that affect today's energy. You know, I like to ground myself in today and live in the present. And I have to remind myself to do that every day. And Julie, that's important. When I walk into that classroom, they're expecting this upbeat, passionate, you know. And I remember one time I was in Maui and my I got a phone call right before I walked in class and my brother had unexpectedly passed away. Yeah. And I, I, I just, but I got into a space where it didn't enter the classroom. I mean, I got into a space where nobody would have known where they're still getting 100% of me, the best me they could get for that whole day. And then I get, when I leave, I, then I can go back to my own dealing with my personal life. But I think if therapists would just say, people feel through your touch, whether you're stressed out or you're, they feel through your words and the way you're presenting yourself. So I think when you enter that treatment room or that classroom, whatever's going on in your personal life, and I said, like, should stay out there. And there's a time and a place to separate those. And I think if you do that, they have so much respect because every patient deserves to be a VIP patient, whether that's your first or your seventh. And when you treat every one of them like that, they're going to they're gonna continue to rebook. But if you share, oh, I'm exhausted today, or you bring in the negative, I mean, I feel, I personally feel it's people's energy. So if they're really depressed and down, I, and I'm sitting next to you, I can feel that energy. So I can feel, and I'll try to shift it. As we know, higher energy can move that negative energy into a higher place of being. So I think it's important that we be the leader. I got to be, I gotta, if I want a supercharged classroom, I got to be the leader in that. Mm -hmm. I can't come go, okay, my AB is not working. This is not working. I'm, I'm like, I'm stressed out today. I was late to plan. Don't, like, if there's a reason to avoid all those obstacles. But once you walk in that treatment room or that other room, that's a big part of marketing. What do they, how do you greet them? It's like, hey, I'm glad you're here today. This is going to be a great session today. This is so awesome. I'm so glad. How is your family? How are you doing? You know, that social aspect of healing is pretty, pretty important. So. Yeah, and it's part of the trust that they have in you as the therapist too, that you're actually listening to what they're telling you when you're when they're talking. Yeah. I think 
one of my number one lessons that I like to to tell therapists is just listen to people and regurgitate what they said back mm-hmm. to them. You're you're telling me that it hurts when you move this way. You know, there's something yeah. that you did where you throw in a baseball playing tennis, you know, what caused that to happen? Has that been happening long term? Tell me more about that. And I think they feel heard. And I think that's the number one thing that I've heard from my clients that they haven't gotten from other therapists. And that will, that will distinctly make you a better therapist and a better person, to be honest, overall. And if you yep. take the time to actually open your ears, my mom used to say you have two ears that are always open and a mouth that can close. And, and you know, one thing I, another lesson I've learned from being married 21 years is, is the art of actively listening. In other words, in many communications, the listener is already formulating the answer. I've been really bad, really bad about that. And then I'll, I won't even listen to the entire statement. And sometimes I'll do it with a student or I'll do it with my wife or my staff. And I think active listening is something I personally have to practice all the time. Okay, let me let me hear what you're saying. Let me process what you're saying. Don't get defensive. Don't have an answer. And I think for me, being a good listener for somebody that's in pain on that table, that is absolutely critical. So if someone in the classroom says, well, can I ask you a question? I go, no, right now I'm present with this patient. If I give up my presence with this patient to talk to you, then I can't give them 120% of what they need. Well, the support they need on this table. So I think being an active listener takes practice, so especially maybe men are worse than women, but we have this thing about, about pretending we're listening, but we're not really listening. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I'm going to just take responsibility for my own. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about that. I mean, male massage therapists are, are, they have an uphill battle. I mean, it's one of the very few industries in the world that, you know, men really don't have the advantage. So talk to, talk a little bit about that. How can a male massage therapist be successful in this world? So when I retired from being a paramedic, I had a 401k, I had, you know, 10 weeks of vacation, you know, all the stuff you get, medical, dental. And then it went, was none of that. I had to pay all that out of pocket. So when I first got in the profession and started to work at the YMCA at a massage school, I was dead broke. I was living in a $300 apartment. I had no money. I could barely pay my bills. And, and the, you had to, you had to brand yourself. You had to come up with a unique part of who you are. And for me, I was, I was a, you know, runner. I was, a, I, I'm always in the gym at five days a week. Even today, I got, I'm going to do sports massage. But then I had to find a leader. So then I found Michael McGillicuddy and Benny Vaughn. Benny's the world leader in sports massage. I go, I want to be like you. So I had to take and take some courses and I couldn't afford courses. So I would sign people that I'd go to the FSMT and do the monitor. And I'd send people and I'd just stare at what he's doing. I'm like, wow, I want to do that. And I think, I think as a male therapist, I really struggled the first time. For two years, I thought, I'm going back to be a paramedic. I'm going to go back teaching paramedic functions at universities. I can't survive. I can't do it. But then when you brand yourself, and branding is so critical. Like we started with the word sports massage. Then I was studying with Whitney Lowe, and we thought, well, this is more orthopedic. So we changed it to orthopedic massage. And then I wanted my audience to be chiropractic, physical therapy, athletic training. I, I want to do, I do at least one chiropractor conference a year with 200 chiropractors in my class. But they, but the word massage, which I'm proud of, I'm proud to say massage, but then I changed it to integrated manual therapy, meaning whether you're a PT, chiropractor, osteopath, whatever you are, we're going to integrate what we all do. And then I study their work and I align with their work. And so now the word in- branding is important. I do integrated manual therapy. I don't allow somebody to say you're just a massage therapist because of all my advanced studies. You know, I, I, I defend our, our profession when they say, well, you're just a masseuse. That's that's not appropriate. We're LMTs. We're licensed. I know certain things push my button, but one thing I learned that somebody suggested one day: I need to put a speed bump between my brain and my mouth. Right? <laughs> you know how you you know how you want to say something. So every time I go to say something, if, when they say, "Oh, you're just a masseuse," I can hear my wife's voice going, "Take a deep breath." It's not really hear it, but I'm thinking, "Take a deep breath. Be careful what you say because you can't take that back." Yeah. Right? So, so I think. Brand yourself, believe in yourself. This profession, massage therapy profession, has never been in a better place. We can take cranial work and osteopathic work and muscle alignment work and visceral work and lymphatic work. And I've studied all those different modalities so I can pick and choose between all these different modalities. 
And now when I talk to these doctors, I go, wow, you guys are like brilliant. Like you work on scars, you work on soft tissue, you balance muscles to balance bones, you release trapped nerves. And so my elevator speech, I do integrated manual therapy, but I am really, there's no better time to be a massage therapist. But but I love teaching. I love teaching. Every year I teach osteopaths in Ireland. And when I teach chiropractors in Florida, and then I sit in their classes and I go, well, how can we work best together? So even at the age of 67, I'm always the student. I'm always going, there's another piece, another piece, another piece. And the more I know, I think the more humble I get because ego is really a lack of confidence and self-esteem. I think, and then my wife always reminds me, which I'm gracious for, about the importance of humility. And then I think humility gets you confident. And then you, so my job in this industry is to serve people. My job is to help as many therapists as I possibly can, help as many clients as they possibly can. So this has really become my passion rather than my job, which is why I don't mind teaching every week. And I missed it in 220. I missed seeing that light bulb go on and that said, I can help that person with that shoulder or that back or that knee. And that's my my drive. I want students to be better than I am. There's there's no turf wars. There's no hidden secrets. They're like, we just are here to help people in pain. And after my own injury, I know what that's like to live in pain. So then there's more empathy, more compassion, and more caring out there. So that's awesome. I love it. I, I mean, I I think, you know, one of my very first episodes, I I interviewed Peggy Lamb. Do you know Miss yep. Peggy Lamb? She's an awesome instructor. And one of the things that we both share in common is the philosophy that whenever we go through our own physical pain and and struggles, that's a learning opportunity for someone in the future that's on my table that they just had that problem. And, oh, I understand. I can empathize with you. I had that issue that happened to me. Same kind of story. And they like that. And you got through it and they go, and that gives them faith. They they like that. Hey, when I had that injured leg and, you know, my back, I could barely walk. I was bent over. But but there's hope. I mean, we're going to always give them hope. No matter what happens, you should feel better when you get off my table. But you should feel better emotionally. You should feel better physically. And we have to be that cheerleader. We can't go, oh, you have a hernia. Just don't pull out the negative, point out the positive outcomes that we're going to achieve today. And they're going, oh, okay, I already feel better and you haven't touched me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I love I love that attitude of, of reinforcing the positive, even if they come in with negative. Oh, I hurt. I'm in pain. This hurts. I'm tired. I don't feel good. The day is crappy weather, you know, whatever is going on in their head. And as a therapist, you, you can say, I'm so glad you're here. I really hope I can help you. What a great day to get a massage. Every day is a great day to get a massage. I don't care what the stinking weather looks like. You're getting a massage. That's a good day. That's a really good day. I'm so thankful. And Julie, Harvard and Yale research says that every thought we give energy to, every thought we, we pay attention to and start playing in our head, manifest it, every cell in our human body, the level of changing our DNA. So, so when you're walking around, my back hurts, my back hurts, the cells are listening. I mean, I tell this in every one of my classes to every one of my clients, what you say and what you play in your brain about you, whether you're smart enough or you're in pain, the, the cells are listening. So every cell in the human body communicates every thought that you consistently give energy to, to the point of changing your DNA. So I used to, when I was walking on crutches after my accident, I knew I wanted to be back out teaching. I knew I needed to keep moving. I knew, you know, it wasn't easy. And I'll tell people it's not easy to get through those those challenging times, but it was it was critical so that I could lead by example to the people that are going through these struggles. And I think that's important. And I share it only if they ask, hey, have you ever had, how, do, how can you relate to me? And I go, well, can I share my story? Oh, I got through that. And then they're going, well, if you can do it, I can. Well, you know, James, I have to be honest. I saw you at the World Massage Festival last last year, and I didn't take a class from you, but I overheard somebody telling me about your accident. And I thought to myself, as I'm going through this podcast, I was like, you know, you were already on the top of my list to interview, obviously, but I wanted to, I wanted to talk about it because I know it was something that, you know, had to have changed your life. And I'm thankful that it was in a good way. 
You know, it was 220. And I, you know, when you're stripped away of everything, your, your finances, your passion, your travels, your jobs, your seminar, and then you're all of a sudden your physical health is really in bad place. Um, some people will turn to drugs and alcohol or whatever. For me, my wife and I are getting involved with Bible study. And we, we have faith. We just, I'm not preaching religion, but I'm just saying we believe in higher, we believe in our faith. And, and I think what's important that we have faith in our ability to heal. And I, and I think if I could do it all over again, I think that was the pivoting point in my life between having cancer eight years ago and having that injury. Those were places that really brought me to a new place of compassion, empathy, and inspiration and positive thinking. And But it can turn in both ways. I mean, some people, they'll start getting addicted to the Oxycontin and, and the, you know the, all these bad drugs that are out there. And that's just not an option right now. But like that, that's just going to mess up your life. But but it's not easy going through pain and and but I go. What's at the end of the tunnel? What's what's down the road? And if I do this, how come? How many people could I inspire when I walk in that room, living perfectly? Nobody would even know today the injuries that I had uh, in two twenty. And I and I didn't post it on social media because I knew. And and three weeks after the accident, I was going to be teaching on crutches, teaching. But I was going to be teaching because if I kept, if I didn't keep moving, scars like worse and the emotions get worse. And then, and then you might want to reach out and supplement it with something, drugs or alcohol. I, I think that's not, life is about choices. And I think, I think our accidents, anybody that's been in a lot of pain knows how to be more empathetic, more compassionate and more caring for people that are going through our journeys. And so I just think, um, I'm probably in the best place in my life right now, spiritually, relationship wise, business wise, because of the challenges throughout the 33 years of my life as a massage therapist. So I think it's, uh, you know, I just want to be around good people and and good therapy. And so do your clients. They want to be around good, caring people. And uh, my biggest regret, and I'm going to give this as advice to up and coming therapists. When I was new and didn't know very much information, growing up in a little farm in North Dakota, I had low self-esteem, lack, lack of self-confidence. So it's probably the first 10 years of my practice, I had a big ego, which which is not a good thing. And then when I met Fran, and I think we got married in 2000, she, I, I met her father. And he was, you know, managed the Phillies, the Cubs, the Rangers. I didn't even know that for a year because she saw him. But then what I saw him do was charity and community and, give, you know, go have a signed autograph ball. Kitty doesn't even know in the hospital. And he was a servant. And I'm getting goosebumps. I'm actually getting emotional because he was my greatest mentor. And I thought, I said to Fran, someday I hope to be happy. As of the servant as your dad. So I wanted to be, but family first and people first. And then the career, you know, we, we can't put all of our energy into our career. We have to put it into the people we love. So I think that was a, a good transition for me, a good lesson. I, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for my wife's friend. It's pretty. I think that's amazing. And I, you know, she's I, a very lucky woman to have you as well. And I think you guys make a great team together. Now, James, do you see clients during the week? Right now, I'm not seeing clients for the last for the last uh, probably 15 years. I've, I've just been traveling, but I've been on the road almost every single weekend of the year. And then, you know, people think we don't do much when we're back home. Well, we're in the I'm in the, my office, and we're in the office doing you know doing like we in 220. We updated all of our handouts, all of our PowerPoints, a lot of our video footage. We got 13 courses online approved by NCTMB. So I'm busy doing what I love, but, and what I love is not being in this office. What I love is being out there, motivating therapists to be great therapists. So I don't see clients. I, I kind of make it, this is what we're doing this year. We're doing vacations. We're doing retreats. Like we're doing a retreat in Italy and we're doing, doing something in Costa Rica and we're doing something in Puerto Rico and we're doing something in Ireland, Scotland. At being senior citizen now, 67 years old, I, I want to see the world and make money doing it. And I want people to experience the world with us. So why I'm not seeing clients right now, I, I might be in six months, but I, because I miss it. I miss that one-on-one, -on -one, but I get to have that in my seminars. I take the worst case studies in every seminar, but I still miss that personal one-on-one -on -one thing. So at this point, probably in six months, I'll start seeing clients. But right now I'm building retreats and I'm doing my bucket list and I'm trying to figure out where we want to go and bring all these people to all these special retreats so they can bond and laugh and you know what it's like to go to a conference where you're hugging people and you, you exchange folk and you keep in touch for 10, 15, 20 years. And I want to build more of that. I like that plan. That's a great plan. Are, 
So you're you're working every weekend this year, pretty much teaching pretty much. all over the world. Sounds like an exciting and busy life. I didn't expect you to to say that you were treating clients at the same time. Because <laughs> I can't imagine traveling every weekend to someplace new and actually being available to see clients during the week as much as you, you and your business and your wife and, and Allison do for your business. Now, you talked about changing your name to integrated, tell me again, integrated body. Integrated manual therapy. Since I was a student, 33 years ago, I thought, what if we could all work together? The chiropractic, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, the osteopath. And my vision has always been that. Not have turf wars. Well, I'm not going to share this patient and not have. And my vision has always been that. So sports massage really was only, only people going to show up in my class are people working with that. It's a very limited market. Then I met Whitney Lowe in 1993. He taught me the critical importance of orthopedic assessment, clinical reasoning, and special chest. That launched my career. I evaluated everybody. So then I changed it to orthopedic massage because we're treating musculoskeletal pain and injury. And then a lot of people go, well, what's orthopedic massage, right? So then we go, I go, my, we, as a staff, we consulted and we go, let's go with the name. Let's rebrand everything. All of our flyers, handouts, videos, everything called integrated manual therapy. As a result of that, I'm teaching osteopaths in Scotland and Ireland. I'm teaching, you know, the chiropractic conference every year in Florida. I'm teaching physical therapy. I've done the National Athletic Training Conference. And by looking at this integrated male therapy, what we do as massage therapists covers the weakness of some people that don't do good soft tissue care. So if the chiropractor adjusts, but they don't look at the scars and the muscle imbalances and do corrective exercises, then we're not integrated. So integrated manual therapy is saying, how can we all integrate? And the other question I had is way back in 1990, when I graduated from Susco, it was all about neuromuscular or craniosacral or osteopathic, but only you typically really specialized in one. But then I went, it's all about all of it. So now I'm certified in lymphatic drainage and I'm going to be taking some cranial osteopathic because I had an osteopath work on my, I didn't even know I had a concussion, but he said, you've had a concussion. He worked on my head when I was there about six months ago. And I said, I need to learn this. It's, it's like, it's like up ledger's work on steroids kind of thing. It's osteopathic cranial work. And I thought, well, if we get the brain out of the straight jacket, so integrated manual therapy means I want to, if you have acute injuries, I want to do lymphatic drainage and scar tissue work. If you have a concussion, I want to do cranial work. If you have orthopedic conditions, I want to evaluate and balance muscles, bones, ligaments, and tendons. And I'll be honest with you, you're not going to get this kind of training in medical school because you're not going to be with the master. Like I've studied with Eric Dalton 12 times now between teaching assistant and teaching together. So I want to know about spinal biomechanics. And now why I call it integrated manual therapy is most of the work isn't mine. It's what all my leaders in the industry have shared with me for 33 years, but I'm integrating their, their techniques to bring the body. Because if we put the body into balance and change the, what the brain's saying to the the body has the innate wisdom to heal itself. We just rebuilt the computer system. We balance muscles, bones. We look at ascending syndromes, trapped nerves. So over 33 years, I've been able to train with world leaders in all these different disciplines. And therefore, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not, if somebody says, what's your elevated speeds? Well, I teach integrated manual therapy and I teach to massage, chiropractic, physical therapy, like training. But my favorite audience, on, and I'm going to be honest with you, is the massage therapy. They are the nicest, kindest, most loving, fun. I love them all, but my favorite. I'm just really, Benny Vaughn said the same thing. Someday, what we do will not be called alternative and complementary medicine because people come to us last with these injuries, but they really should be coming to us as soon as they're evaluated and cleared by their position, we're probably the, the soft tissue specialists. So I think if we believe in our potential to facilitate the body's innate wisdom to heal itself emotionally, energetically, and posturally and structurally, the word massage, I don't think it does it the justice that when I teach chiropractors, I still teach them massage, soft tissue rebalancing, scar tissue work. But then I'm teaching them how to integrate that into what they learned at Parker Chiropractic. So the integrated manual therapy model opened more more doors for international seminars for me than anything else. And if I ever do a book again, I don't know if I ever will, but it would be called integrated. And and it's doing no injustice to massage because massage is the staple of that work. Well, and I think that goes right along with the message about branding. 
Mm-hmm. To be honest, because on the flip side, you're solving a problem that society has. <laughs> society has this problem where we have we have chiropractors, PTs, massage therapists, all these different people. And if we could come to one place, walk in the door and go, I have a, I, you know, whatever I have, whatever my problem is, I can come in and I can get you know, chiropractic care, I can get physical therapy care, I can get massage therapy all in one place and they're all working together for the betterment of my health. What a great way to solve that issue that instead of having to go to, where do I go? What do I do? And who do I see? And do I do dry needling? Do I do acupuncture? There's all these different things. And even as a therapist, it's hard to you know, manipulate and manage your way through this crazy world of all these different types of things and who pays for what and insurance and let's not even go there. But I think rebranding your business as an integrated therapy center. Sorry, I don't I know that's not exactly the words, but I think that makes sense. It and it does imply that there is more of a more than just yeah. and i'm not saying that we are enough but it is a integrative way to approach a holistic way to approach the body and the problem or whatever the issue may be that they're coming in for and julia the how the how drastic the world's changing is i was contacted by one of the top physiotherapists in kuwait and he works with the top surgeon in the world with shoulders, right? Dr. Ali is his name. He's the top shoulder guy in the world. And he said he turns away 50% of soft tissue repairs because if you balance the muscles and treats the scar and you get functional movement, the body has the innate wisdom to heal itself. So he flew me out to Kuwait to, to treat a really complicated patient whose shoulder was just a little, they said it was a frozen shoulder, but it was really just multiple scars and emotional trauma. And long story short, after I treated that person, the kinetic chain and all this, they were able to move their arm. And, and Dr. Ali Watson, he's the leading surgeon in the world. He goes, I don't all, all therapists know how to integrate the scar tissue work and the trapped nerve work and the Moscow work. And I go, someday, my vision and my dream is that all massage therapists, because we don't have to pay for medical school alone because we can train with the masters in the trenches doing spinal bound mechanics and doing soft tissue balancing and cranial osteopathic or cranial sacral and visceral and lymphatic and scar work and microcurrent. And it goes on. I would have never learned all this in medical school. Never, never, never. Not in a billion right. years. So we are in the right place at the right time to see the future of manual medicine changing where we're not going to struggle to pay our bill because we are going to take people in complicated pain patterns and bring them back into balance and treat their scars and decompress their joints. And so, and I, lo- I really love that I have a broad audience of anybody that's done new therapies that I get to teach at all their conferences. So I'm so blessed. And I don't just teach there I learn from all of them. Well, could you show me a couple of techniques of what you would do in rehab or you would do? And if we talk nice and play nice together, and when I see a student go, what does the, and they'll say, PT know, because they're doing exercise-based rehab. And some, on all levels of every profession, there's high level and low. So my wife's back, and I know a lot of work. I couldn't solve the problem. So we took her to a physical therapist in Colleyville, I mean, South Lake. And she said, well, her back's gone flat. The, the, the fluid's pushing out of her disc, so we need to get the curve back in there. And she taught me something I didn't know at all. And she's a PT. And she said to me, if I do a technique and it hurts, it's the wrong technique. If I do a technique and it hurts, it's the wrong technique. And I will not let your wife do exercise-based rehab unless her body's healthy enough to do the exercises. So she was an industry leader. And if I say, well, what does the PT know? I would have never had that opportunity to study under this amazing woman. So I think, I think just being nice and playing nice and integrating what we all do can change the face of manual medicine. Well, and, and respecting the knowledge that other people have, I think, going back to the humility talk, I mean, being humble and saying, you know, I don't know how to do this. Can you show me? Or can you talk to me about what you're doing here? Ask questions to your ego beside and, and, and say, you know, I, I appreciate your knowledge. Can you please share it with me? 
is I and no one to refer out, no one to refer out. And then when you refer out, what did your colleague find? What were their clinical? What did I miss? No one to refer out to. I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to take any more of your time because I know you're a very busy person and I am too. I'm so excited that you joined me today. James, do you have anything else that you want to share? Any well, other I goals? I mean, you may post this too, but I think if anybody's interested in my courses or my work, my website is www.orthomassage, O-R-T-H-O-Massage.net. And um, we hope to see you in some future workshops. I think it'll help you become successful because I don't just teach technique. I teach motivation. I teach, I teach goal setting. I teach believe in yourself. I teach positive thinking. So, so my life journey has made me a better teacher. And I, I do want to thank people that learn different, like the autistic or because they teach me how to teach. They teach me how to be more visual, kinesthetic, auditory connected. And they teach me how to teach positive, loving reinforcement on, on instead of negative feedback. So so just to go out there and be the best therapist you can be. And, and thanks for the opportunity, the blessing to do this interview with you, Julie. Absolutely. We're very humbled by your knowledge. And, and thank you so much. We're going to share your links and all of our social media and the podcast that you're listening on today. So make sure you follow James Waslowski and check out his course list if he's coming to your area anytime soon. I would highly recommend his class any of them across the board i've i've taken several so thank you james i appreciate you thank you so much for joining me on the handcrafted therapy podcast i would love to hear from you you can email us at podcast at handcraftedtherapy.com or you can come by the store it's at 3303 north central expressway suite number 240 in plano texas 75023 or you can connect with me on social, Instagram, Facebook, hashtag handcrafted therapy. I'm Julie Alexander, and I wish you a very happy and healthy day.